I'm Brenda Murray and this is Studio 56 and I want to welcome you uh, to the chat that I'm going to be having today with Hazel Sohn about her upcoming book, Learn to Paint Portraits Quickly. Hazel is an extremely talented artist working in watercolor, oil and acrylic. She has exhibited worldwide and is well known for her role teaching art on television in the UK. She is a best-selling author of numerous highly regarded art tutorial books and she has four online workshops here at Studio 56 Boutique, Painting Figures Quickly, Figures on the Beach, Painting Wildlife, and Happy Elephants. Welcome, Hazel. Hello. Uh, hello, everybody. So, Hazel, um, let's just talk about your, your book. It's a lovely book. It's a hardcover. It, the, the publisher is Batsford, and we are looking at 100 pages, 108 pages with lots of beautiful um, images inside the book. I, I won't uh, show too many pages, um, but uh, this is a this lovely, lovely book. And you have several books published by Batsford. Is that right, Hazel? Yes, and this book is part of a series which are called the Learn Quickly series. And the idea is that you disseminate a lot of information in a very succinct format. So these are really the nuggets of portrait painting, because if you did flick through a few pages, you'll see this very little text compared to picture strength. And th this is the idea is that in basically about less than an hour, you can read the entire book and you can be painting your first portrait then. That's the yeah. idea of it. it. Really gets your confidence high very quickly and you haven't got to waste loads of time reading lots of stuff, trying to retain it. The idea is that you are going to paint and paint portraits in this instance. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. It's really well bound and it's a lovely hardcover book. And this book is available on Amazon, is that right? Correct, yes, yes. You can pre-order. It's actually published on the 3rd of February. But I think sometimes Amazon get advanced copies, so it may be available even before. But you can pre-order already now, and then it will officially, officially be published on the 3rd of February. Okay, and I got my advanced copy, and I love it. It's, it is a <laughs> gorgeous book, a gorgeous book. Wonderful. Um, and so, Hazel, tell me about um, your interest in portrait painting. Was that sort of the first thing that you uh, started painting when you were a uh, younger, young student? It actually was the very first thing that gave me the confidence to believe in myself as an artist because I had painted a charcoal portrait made up actually, but it was a face made up when I was 13 and a great aunt of mine saw this, thought it was rather good, showed, asked if she could show it to a friend of hers, showed it to the friend who worked in the House of Commons. And for me, somebody who worked in the House of Commons in our English Parliament, uh, yeah. you know, that somebody high, high, high up the ladder. And she had been on a, a, a work program out to Hong Kong. And she came back with two little brushes, which she gave to me to encourage me to paint. Oh. Now, I realized that brushes in Hong Kong, you know, these kind of brushes, they're like two a penny. But to me, these brushes were the most precious thing that someone who didn't know me would actually want to support my desire to paint. And uh, it, that was a huge confidence booster. Yeah, And so my first portrait means a lot to me. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know where it is now. But it was really, I can honestly say it was the start of my painting. And one of the beautiful things about portraiture is that you've, most of us have got a face. Yeah. <laughs> and so what a subject matter. So we can, we can paint something and it's self-portrait. And so, you know, it's very easy to access a self-portrait if you've got a mirror. And yeah. um is it, you know, even a, an iPhone. <laughs> you can always practice. And the great masters, uh, a lot of them practice on their own, did their own self-portraits a lot. Be hard pressed to find an artist, a figurative artist who hasn't painted their face over and over and over. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this book uh, is divided into, um, I'm going to just talk about the chapters of your book. Um, so chapter one is about, let me go back to the people come uh, finding the likeness and chapter two creating form the light and shade chapter three the facial features chapter four painting the hair chapter five skin tone and coloring and then chapter six the body clothing and background um, really it's a, this book is just really covering everything you need to know about how to start portrait painting because a lot of people find it really daunting right like really 
uh, frightening to think about portrait painting. And so your book is demystifying portrait painting, right? That was yeah. my plan. What I wanted to do was rather than, uh, so rather than going into too much detail, what I wanted to do was explain how you approach painting someone's portrait to get rid of the fear of that the idea that you might fail to catch the likeness, because usually the only reason people don't paint portraits is because they're afraid they won't catch the likeness. Because it's, it's unusual to find someone who doesn't want to paint faces and people because we are, faith, you know, we are faces and people. And it's so, but a lot of people don't dare because they're afraid that they won't catch the likeness and then they will lose their confidence. And so the, the book is explaining that likeness will come by default if you do other things. And so that the book explains how to look at mainly the head. The, there is, a, you know, in a short book like this, really the emphasis is on sort of this area rather than full body portraits. That would be a whole other book I'd love to do. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, and, and I do, I, I hope it does demystify it so that people will feel, you know, oh, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, let's just uh, look. We've got a, a few uh, images from the book that we're going to be uh, looking at today. So let's just get started looking at those images. And uh, I have a few other questions here and I got quite a lot of questions coming up. So we'll, we'll ask the questions while we're looking at some of your images. So Hazel, if you could turn off your, um, your video, but not your sound. There we go. All right. There we go. Can you see that in a full screen, Hazel? I can, yes. Okay, beautiful. So uh, maybe tell me a bit about how you would approach painting a, a portrait, in the, generally speaking, such as a portrait like this one. Well, I, I'm actually rather amused that you've chosen this one first because this girl modeled for me for a, a video that we were making of uh, portrait painting. And she, it was a very hot studio and she, she fainted, poor love, because she was posing oh. so. And it was a really good lesson in that the first, almost before you paint, you need to make sure your model is comfortable because the model doesn't know what to expect. And it's lovely to paint from life. I, I think a lot of you will probably find your painting uh, portraits from photographs, that's fine. But to paint from life is really thrilling. And in this instance, uh, she, posed, she sat absolutely beautifully. None of us thought about the temperature of the lights and the poor girl just suddenly keeled over and we had to rescue her. And so I, whenever I look at this portrait, it always reminds me that the first thing before, and it's, it's a very good one that you chose first, because the first thing, if you're going to paint somebody, is to assure them how long they've got to sit for, whether they can move their mouth, whether they can move their eyes, their hair, etc. And so this is almost rule number one, I would say, if you can have rules, is that if you are painting somebody, imagine, you know, you're not going to know the first time you paint how long it's going to take, but you can tell the person, right, sit for 10 minutes and then you can shuffle around or can you last half an hour to start with? As a rule of thumb, nobody can sit for more than 45 minutes for a very first session, and then it's got to be 30 minutes thereafter, because otherwise it just gets too um, exhausting for people. But um, even if you are modeling yourself in the mirror, it's, it's hard to sit still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And so what uh, media is this uh, painting created in? This is oil on canvas, and the, um, I can't remember all the various colors used, but it's quite a lot, it's sort of about, um, I want to say 24 by 16, something like that sort of size. And it does, if this is actually, I've cropped this horizontally, it actually is a, a portrait shaped portrait in that it goes down to um, sort of, um, it's beyond the head and shoulders, a bit lower than the head and shoulders. Um, but I wanted it to be able to fill the screen because obviously video screens are horizontal. Mm -hmm. and Okay, I'm just gonna click ahead to the next one. So now we have here uh, an, uh, another a portrait, but in a completely different medium. And, um, and you're now dealing with different kinds of skin tones. And that was one of the questions that somebody asked. Um, do you have a, any specific palette colors for African skin? Well, actually in the book, I do give uh, sets of colors for various skin tones because it's quite important not to use too many colors. One reason being that there isn't a lot of time 
for you to, I mean, well, there could be as much time as you want in a sense, but it's best if you don't spend too much time on having to make the mixes. And so if you've got a, a few colors and you don't need many colors to create skin tones. So that's one of the things in the book, there's a whole chapter on that because with very few colors, you can make a huge number of different skin tones for all uh, skin colors. And so this medium here is actually Conti pencil with watercolor tinted over the top. You can probably see if you look closely, the um, sort of texture of the Conte pencil, which is like a charcoal sort of pencil. And then the watercolor washes are over the top. And this is particularly about the structure. This picture appears when I'm talking about the structure of the chin and the jawline and the cheeks because often we think of the features as the eyes, nose and mouth, but I make a point in the book of pointing out that the forehead is a huge part of the head. Okay. And are a very big portion of the head and the chin line is terribly important. So, you know, th this, uh, I'm, I'm really, um, I use lots of different portraits to emphasize different things that you need to notice when you're painting. Right. Okay. Let's just move ahead to your next uh, one. And here's another painting. And this is a uh, oil or acrylic. This is oil on canvas. And this painting is about 20 inches square. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so maybe this might be a good time to, to talk a little bit about the background that you've painted in there. I mean, I love the shape of the shoulders, a very strong um, uh, shape of, of her shoulders and everything. And, and then you've got a, a light background right around the shoulders and a little bit darker. Can you tell me a little bit about painting backgrounds? Yes, background is very important in the sense that it will support the foreground. And I do spend some time talking about that nearer the end of the book rather than earlier on in the book, because you need to use either counter change to bring out light. So in other words, you offset darks against lights or lights against darks to bring out your portrait. And you don't necessarily need a complicated background with portraiture because the image is the person. Mm -hmm. And so instance, with this lovely dark uh, shoulder shape, as you say, and the tilt. And, and the other, um, one of the other emphases that I make in the book is angle of the face. So here we have almost a full face, but it's slightly three quarter angle. And then there's a slight tilt and all those kind of things can add to it. So rather than we, the previous one, the first, the young girl was looking straight at us, full on front face and both the previous images. So now here we have a slight tilt and then we have a slight turn. Mm -hmm. And obviously these things can add to your portraiture. And in this instance, you can see the tilt of the shoulders is one way and then the tilt of the eyes and the mouth and the head and the nose, obviously, because they're all parallel, is the other way. And so right. it makes a very endearing and charming. You really engage with the person and the smile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a gorgeous painting. And so um, I'm going to we've got quite a lot of questions coming up. And I, I really do want to ask as many as I can. Um, but uh, the main question that I think I want to, to ask you is, um, how do you catch a likeness or how do you get over the fear of not catching a likeness? I suppose that's two separate questions, but what, do you, what are your secrets for catching a likeness? Well, in one simple word, it's measuring. Okay. Because more or less the eyes, nose and mouth on every human being are more or less in the same position. So the first thing to just ask yourself simply is what makes us unique? What, what, why, how do we recognize each other one from the other if our eyes and nose and mouths are all in the same position? And what it is, it's the slight differences of distance between the features. It is the features themselves as well, but strangely, they're not as important to the likeness as the distance between the eyes, for example, the length of the nose, the distance between the nose and the lips, the width of the mouth in relation to below the eyes. And so most of portrait painting is about seeing the features in relation to each other, rather than thinking of the features as features in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, got a great question here from Piero, uh, who is who basically was asking about um, what we just what, what you just said, but he also added on how come a caricature can convey a likeness better than a finished portrait. Um. 
that's the genius of cartoonists, isn't it? <laughs> I suppose by emphasizing a feature that is recognizable. So for example, if someone has a large nose, if you then increase the size of it in your caricature, then you are drawing attention to the, the very thing that you feel is their likeness. Mm -hmm. I would say it's quite hard to do a caricature of a baby because babies don't have their features formed. And actually it's quite hard even to do a portrait of a baby because they don't have all the lovely wrinkles that we gain as we live on earth. So a, a caricature is a different art form and a very fantastic art form uh, to portrait painting. Okay. It, I mean, it, by, by nature of itself, it's tending to be satirical to some extent, or it's tending to um, be humorous. Usually a portrait is meant, is usually more a dignified thing. It's usually about creating an, a more eternal image of somebody. It's not meant to be like a photograph, which is a moment in time or a moment in a year or a moment in someone's age. A portrait tends to be able to be like that person for their entire life, mm -hmm. even though it might be painted at one time in their life. Right. So we have a question here from Annette. She's saying, how do you paint blonde hair? And, and here's an example right here of somebody with blonde hair. Well, my base color for blonde hair is almost always raw umber. Raw umber is one of those colors which you can't really live without <laughs> because it works both for under darks and under lights. And blonde hair tends to look, it can look uh, pale blue in light, pale green in light. Uh, it can look golden, it can look white. So it really, it's actually looking at the blonde hair and seeing whether it pertains towards yellow or towards gold or towards uh, a sort of what I would call um, a strawberry blonde coloring or whether it, you know, the blonde hair can go in many different directions. And you can see here, if you look closely, I have painted the raw umber, the neat raw umber, which is the darkest brown in the hair first. And then the uh, lighter colors are painted. The mid-tones are then painted on top and then the light tones on top. And this is discussed in a whole a chapter on hair. Watercolor is different because watercolor you paint from light to dark, so it's different. This is an oil painting. And so in the, the, the main technique of oil painting is to paint from dark to light because you have the opacity of the oil paints. Mm -hmm. Whereas in water, you need to paint from light to dark. So it's a bit different if you're painting, um, you know, blonde hair. I don't know if I've included a self-portrait in, in, um, uh, in images that I, I digitally uh, sent you, but um, hopefully I have. So we can look at watercolor blonde hair. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we will. You, it, it will be coming up. So here's a, a, an example of a, a baby in watercolor. And somebody did ask if you have any tips for painting children. Uh, I do. <laughs> wait, wait till you're asked. Don't offer. <laughs> children do not want to sit still. So either you have got to resort to photographs and I would suggest that if you're ever going to paint uh, children because someone has commissioned you, you take the photographs. Don't rely on other people providing the photographs because it's very difficult to get photographs that really work for a painting. People will take the photographs, you know, because they're a, a photograph of the child. So if you are able to get the photographs done yourself, ask if you can have a little session with the child. And also you get to know the child, so you get to know what is their likeness because someone else's photograph may not be the likeness of that child. We accept that a photograph is, in inverted commas, true, but in fact, it's just a flat image taken in a moment of time. Whereas your portrait is another kind of truth. It is something that is, as I said before, much more perennial, much broader and wider. And so it's important to get your own uh, photographs of the child if you're not going to paint from life. If you're going to paint from life, you've got to paint fast. <laughs> right, yeah, really good idea. And so when you're taking uh, your own pictures of a child to paint, what are you looking for in the picture? What are you trying to, to capture in the well, photo? Because, they, because it's unusual for a child to have a face that has a lot of... Uh, I don't want to say interest because of course they have interest because they've got lovely big eyes and they've got cute little noses and darling mouths but they're almost too pretty and too cute 
And so it's quite good to have the whole child, which I have done in this instance, because then it gives you not only a chance to do the body, which is always you know, wonderful because it gives you all the opportunities of a range of tones, but to include their toys, because those are part of this sort of, uh, you know, more perennial thing. In other words, when you look back on those pictures as the owner then of the portrait, there is a whole memory of a time in that child's life and a period so that it isn't, a, it isn't one photograph of the child at a time. It is, oh yes, I remember how Harry in this case loved that little truck, loved that little cushion. Mm -hmm. And so I would recommend with children that it's a good idea to do, you know, the whole body. But, you know, I mean, some people, pastels is often a, a very good medium for painting portraits. Years and years ago, when I first, uh, before I went to college, I did a lot of pastel painting. I went into schools and things. And um, it's a very quick mean. It's a very good uh, way of portrait painting. I myself prefer using paint. So there's not really, apart from sort of that bit of charcoal conte that you were showing, there's not really pastel paintings in this book. But pastels are actually quite a good medium for painting children because you can draw the child and then almost sort of fill in your colours in a way with pastel, which makes it a bit easier than painting. So I'd recommend, past if you're a pastelist, then I would use pastel and then, you know, children, I think, are a, a more a, a, a less daunting prospect. Right. And, and so um, there's a, a few questions here. Um, I'll try to put them maybe together. And, and that's just that people are, are asking, you know, how do you start your a portrait? Do you start with pencil? Um, how do you approach it? Do you approach, do you do a sort of an outline of the shape? You start with the eyes. How do you start a portrait painting? This is the, probably the very most important question. Yes, outline of shape, because first of all, you need the shape of the head, because that is one of the most distinctive things in terms of likeness. And so it's the shape of the head, including the hair, but noticing where the hairline is. So in other words, the shape of the face within the head. So the first, the first thing is the person posing them. That's the first thing. And Choosing your lighting is good. And this is a good example you've got up here because see the light is from one side. This is actually my son. The light is from one side. And if you have light from one side, it, make, it already gives you something uh, interesting in terms of painting. So instead of having a flat light on the front, which makes it harder to create the features than if you have a light that's slightly different on one side, because as soon as you've got light and shade involved, you've got something meatier to help create your features. And certainly if one side is dark and one side is light, in a way you can uh, hide a lot of things in the shadow and concentrate on the lit side, which so it sort of also gives you a slight reprieve if you're having a, different, a difficulty balancing the two sides of the head. But then I would say, always start with the eyes. Having got your face shape and your axes, so that's your vertical line down the, sorry, can you go back? Uh, oh, sure. Mm -hmm this is a very good one to use to show this. So, so on this, we have a, a nice frontal view. So here, draw on the face shape, draw on the shape, the head shape, and then you take a vertical line right down the center. Now, in this case, you can see it's slightly tilted. Okay, so that's gonna be your, that's your axis line of the head. And then your eyes, your nose, and your chin are roughly third, third, third. The eyes are actually, hardly anybody sort of believes this, but they're, they're only about halfway up the head. The bottom of the, the lower eyelid is usually on the halfway line between the chin and the top of the head. Right. And the top of the head, in a sense, is just below the top of that hairline, because obviously there's a bit of hair above the top of the head. But you can see clearly there that if you drew a line through the middle of the, uh, the lower lids, you would end up with the middle of the head. And so once you sort of begin to realize there are, there's almost a template. So I give this early on, this template of a head because almost every head will fall into that template. And then you can start looking at the particulars of your particular model, your right. person. And I'm flipping through your book and I'm looking at how you, you are talking about asymmetry in the book and um, the tilt and composition, the angle of the head and so on. And lots of information about uh, the, the, whether the person is looking straight on or a three quarter view uh, and how to capture that. And that's all captured in your book. I'm um, gonna push ahead to the next one. And that is a watercolor, very quickly uh, captured. Some are more sort of finished um, paintings of people and others are more quick sketches I can see. 
Well, this, funny enough, this actually is a portrait of one of the curators of the National Portrait Gallery, because I had years and years ago been asked to paint portrait of Bill Brandt, who's a famous photographer. And I, when he was, well, would have been 75, but sadly he had died, uh, they, uh, wanted the uh, one of the portraits and so I met this curator and he turned out to be I mean he obviously in the National Portrait Gallery you're going to be hugely interested in portraits but he also collected portraits of himself done by different artists so he asked if oh. I was interested in doing one I said oh you bet so we went out I mean the National Portrait Gallery in London is one amazing wonderful place anyway but we went up into this top room right at the top where they were busy restoring old portraits and then there was lovely lighting, and you can tell the lighting's from the in his, from his left. And he just sat there. And of course, because he was very knowledgeable about portraiture, he could he sat immaculately still. And you can see he's looking straight at me. Now, if you want the eyes to follow you around the room, then your sitter must look straight at you. It's as simple as that. You know, when people say, "Oh, how do you get it?" So the eyes just have them looking straight into your eyes. If they're looking straight into your eyes then their eyes will follow you around the room wherever you move. Because now if, if you're looking at your screen, just move to your right or to your left and the eyes will follow you because these eyes are looking straight at the painter who's painting him. And at this point where I got to in this portrait and I hadn't considered it finished on the left-hand side and we stopped for him to have a break. And he said, you mustn't touch that. He said, that is me. Don't do another brush stroke. That is me. He said, you will only take away from my, my likeness if you touch it. And so that's how it remained. And that's why I, I wanted in the, uh, I, can't, I think I used this in the section on painting beards, but I have used this once before in another book because I wanted to say, things do not have to be finished to be a likeness. And I mentioned this quite early on in the book that if in your early sketch of the portrait when you first start you suddenly get the likeness and you see it's there you could say and you can say because you're the artist this is finished you don't have to take it to what you thought you might be going to create because if you catch the likeness you might lose the likeness if you try and finish it to you know some kind of perfect either photographic likeness or whatever it is so it's good to step back from your portrait as you do it to recognize when the likeness is caught and to consider whether it's worth stopping even then because a portrait does not is not a photographic likeness it is nothing to do with photography it is something other and so you know this is a perfect example of that is that it was finished uh, before the artist knew it was finished which was me <laughs> yeah right so I'm just going to go back to your previous uh image because um Piero was asking is your son painted in watercolor on brown paper no 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 this is actually oh and this is another thing a good question this because tinted backgrounds are a marvelous way in oils of a speeding up portraiture if you tint this is a, a this is oil on on canvas and the background is stained with my beloved raw umber and it's several layers of raw umber rubbed over the canvas to create that nice transparent glow. And I'm actually pleased he thought it might have been watercolour because this is exactly what I love to do with oils. I love sometimes to make them feel like they're not oils. And so this is a, a raw umber tinted background, which means that when I painted him, I painted the lights and the darks and the raw umber is the mid-tone. And so if you were to look closely, some of his moustache has never been painted. Some of his beard is never painted. Lots of his hair is never painted because that is still the background. Okay, that's a great answer. Um, and so um, Jesse is asking, how do you decide the colors in the background to, is it to support the portrait? Well, they got, I would say you don't necessarily include completely different well hang on two things here if it's a tinted background then your background is already in and tinted and it's going to be the undercolor in your painting so you're already incorporating it into your painting and that's oil painting obviously with watercolor your background is white paper and you're dealing with transparency and colors um, light coming through the colors so i would say in general in general you don't use, uh, can you go, sorry, going too fast here. 
because we've got to talk about that one there because I'm going to use that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Background and the other one hasn't got a background. <laughs> um, so in general, any colours you put in the background are ones that already are in your portrait. So then you don't get any kind of a problem with harmony. And with, with any painting, it's best if your colors harmonize. But if you think back to the turquoise painting, right at the earlier, the blonde, when we were talking about blonde hair, mm -hmm. background was painted with the turquoise. And then I've incorpor I incorporated turquoise um, in her, with her eyes, her blue eyes were just a tint over the turquoise. And there's little areas of turquoise left within her whole face. So in other words, you make sure that your background and your portrait intermarry. If it's a white background and you're adding background, I would say, unless you're using the background like a brilliant David Hockney, where you're using a great lump of lovely color to offset your flesh tones, then I would say err on the side of using. So in this instance, of using colors already in the portrait. Here, her uh, this ultramarine is the blue in this portrait and Indian yellow is the glow of her skin tone. And so the background is Indian yellow and uh, ultramarine blue mixed together to make that green. And again, only put against the lit side so that there is dark against light. And then on the side where her hair is in shadow, dark left the white paper because it's dark against light. And the you know the countertone of, of uh, the contrasts give you a, a powerful background. Right, right. So Hazel, when you're thinking I'm going to make a portrait of someone, do you prefer watercolor, oil, or acrylic? Do you have a preference? Um, I prefer oil and watercolor. I I don't mind acrylic, but I've never I've never been wholly happy with the sort of plasticity uh, of the colors. Um, I, I like them as tints, so it tends to be, I'm, I tend to be a watercolour or oil painter. And my favourite medium of all mediums is watercolour. I mean, I'm just totally and utterly, utterly, utterly besotted and in love with it. So watercolour would be my first choice. But I would say that it's harder to paint a watercolour portrait than an oil portrait because one, you've got to build it up from light to dark. So you haven't got that option where you can have a mid-tone background and then add the lights and the darks, which really, I think, makes portrait painting in oils a simpler process because very quickly you can see if your painting works. With a watercolor, you're trusting those lighter tones and then you're going darker and darker. And so you haven't, sorry, we haven't got, <laughs> you're jumping ahead here. We you haven't talked about um, the one before where I was going to talk about, the, here's a watercolor. Um, so here, I've had to start with very, very, very pale yellow ochre tones. And then I've built up burnt sienna tones. Then I've, because her top was this lovely bright pink, I have incorporated permanent rose in her cheeks, in her lips. You can see it around her eyes so that those colors are in. And then the blue, the, the blue in this case is ultramarine, which if you look closely on her cheek, where her cheek is lit in the shadow, so the, the uh, sort of center of the cheek in sh on the shaded side, that is the blue, that is the, what am I gonna say, the, the color of white in shadow, whereas on her hair, where her hair is deep black, where her hair is lit, then the blue becomes the color of black lit. So it works for both white in shadow and black in light. And so ultramarine blue is a very useful color in watercolor because you can use it as a tint mid-tone and have done two things i.e both light and shadow mm -hmm. cool uh, but we have a really good question here and i'm not sure that there's going to be an example oh there it here we go all right the question is how to paint teeth teeth yes now in general if you are painting from life you won't need to paint teeth because people cannot hold an open smile so if you're painting from life don't even ask them to smile with a big grin because they won't be able to hold it very long at all and you'll regret it from almost you know the minute you start so if you're painting it's always closed mouth with a little teeny bit of smile they won't even be able to hold a huge smile for very long because we just can't do that so only if you're painting from photographs will you ever probably be painting teeth and teeth are very interesting because they're never as white as you think in terms of painting otherwise they stand out like sort of you know ultraviolet sort of things like the people have been to the you know the dentist or something so you've got to look at the tone of them in relation to the rest of the face 
So the first thing is not to assume they are bright white, even if the person has lovely bright white teeth, as Ray does here. But they are going to be shaded by the top lip. They're going to be shaded on the sides where the, where the, I mean, the mouth, I think the first thing to remember is the whole face is curved. It's not a mask. We're not wearing a flat mask on the front of our face. It's all curved so that your mouth is a curve uh, that goes around the face. And so the teeth are also following that. And therefore they're going to be lighter in tone where the maximum light is. So if they're lip, lip from the front, then they're going to be lighter in tone from the front. And then they're going to be slightly darker in tone as they go around and then disappear inside the cheeks. And so that's the thing to look at is to think of the structure of the teeth. So first of all, you could do it as a whole band, just uh, which changes grading in tone without thinking of the individual teeth. And then you just need little tiny dark marks between each tooth, not, not emphasized, just tiny. You, I mean, the pictures, it depends how big your screen is, but you know, unless you actually see the portrait um, yourself, you wouldn't be able to see how gentle those lines between the teeth are to not make them too prominent. Because what you don't want with teeth is that they stick out like sore thumbs. <laughs> uh, you want them to feel like they're within the mouth um, oh, I mean, the eyes basically, rule one, have the eyes working, most of all, the nose structured, but don't give it too much attention to start with, unless it really needs it, because that's something that's so much a part of that person's uh, likeness, and then the expression in the mouth uh, emphasized rather than um, the sort of creases around it or anything, it's, you know, <laughs> The portraiture is always about saying enough, but not too much, because it's the, almost got to look like the person's about to speak or about to laugh or about to smile. It, when you're painting them, you, you feel like you're talking to them. Uh, you know, when I was making this portrait, I was I painted the eyes first and then we were talking together and we were communicating and then the nose was the next uh, main area and then the mouth and once once the mouth's in then you're having conversations between you and the you know you and, and the and the and the portrait. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> with teeth, uh, what I notice is that people are um, they they generally artists are not making such a strong delineation between each tooth they're sort of treating teeth as one thing, um, oh, right. otherwise it looks like they have too much of a gap there. <clears throat> and, um, and that leads me to my next question. It has to do with um, capturing facial hair, not, not so much beards, but I'm talking about eyebrows and eyelashes and so on. Um, can you talk about that, Hazel? Yes, now actually eyelashes, unless you have somebody who's actually sort of got a set of false eyelashes where they're really prominent, unless you're going for sort of super realism and a very huge portrait, in general, the eyelash area is all more of a blur of a darkish sort of line rather than ever actually painting eyelashes. Again, it, the, when you're working from life, you're, the ideal thing is to sit about, mm, I'd say eight feet, 10 feet away from the person. But again, it kind of depends because some, if you, know, if you want to paint a sort of really super real portrait, then you do want to include all those things. And that's slightly different. But the way I paint tends to be a bit more impressionistic. Mm -hmm. And so it's more the shape of the eye bounded by soft lines that follow the light and dark that's happening around the eye. I, I'm, I'm always looking at tone because I'm a figurative artist. And so it is the light and shade of the eye that fascinates me. And I, tr you know, uh, this is my mother, my dear mother, and uh, she's, you could hear somebody wearing glasses. And so you get slightly, the eyes are slightly obscured behind the glasses, but also in a way it draws you more attention to them. So uh, I wanted to make sure that I both shaped the eyes and had her expression coming through but also didn't pay too much attention to the lines because the lines, when I see it, they're, they're not lines, you know, they're, they're shapes. Um, uh, so, you know, obviously I can only paint the way I paint and obviously the book's about the way I paint. Mm -hmm. um, but facial hair, it kind of depends if your intent is to show a lot of detail. My intent is always to be a bit more 
um, loose. And to, I, I want you to almost feel she could move any minute now. Um, if she turns her head, I'll still be able to see her type of thing. It, it's that sort of, I, I almost want her not to be static on the canvas. Yeah, I love the way you captured the collar of her shirt. It looks, it looks lively. It looks, uh, you know, it it looks like it's about to move at any moment. The, the <laughs> clothing. Yeah, sorry, Hazel. Did, I I I didn't hear what you said. No, I was just laughing. I was I thinking, yes, that's lovely. Thank you. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a, it's a nice compliment. Yeah, because that's what you want. I mean, I think that's you know, if you're talking, you're painting life. You want the painting to be full of life and really if it what I would want to say to anybody is even if you felt or even if you read my book and everything and you still feel scared about painting it because you're painting somebody and the information is going to come from that person almost by default it will have some measure of likeness to the person it can't help but because that's your inspiration or your reference so I would say never be afraid, because even if at the time you feel it didn't look like the person, almost, I would like to say, and I can't obviously guarantee, but I would say pretty much if you looked at it in a year's time, and if you looked at it in 10 years time, you would find it looked like the person, because that, because you are working from that person. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. And here we have a uh, another example of somebody with dark skin, and you've you've uh, used uh, lots of different colors. It's sort of a palette that you create. I think you covered this already uh, in the book uh, about how to capture different tones of skin. Yes, I find um, burnt sienna probably works for all skin types, and then with dark skins, I love to incorporate violet, transparent violet, um, all manganese violet, and. I find that, it, that it's the richness. The dark skins have a very rich color. They are quite light. They're lit. When they're lit, they're quite light. And then in the darkness, there is this real warm darkness. And violet, you can't use black. Black is too flat a color. It doesn't have color. So you need to be able to create a color that is as rich as, or richer than black. So I mix violet and burnt sienna together a lot to catch those kind of colors. And in this, this is a perfect instance of that, um, where, you know, there's no, no black has been used. It is uh, actually, um, well, actually there is black in the uh, uh, um, clothing, mm -hmm. because there's another instance where I painted the clothing and then never touched it again, because that is literally just the black tint. Uh, and then I thought, my goodness, it's right. I, I mustn't touch it. I don't want to emphasize it anymore. I need the color in the face. And this tone on the top works, you know, leave it alone, don't touch it, you're going to mess it up. So it's actually, if you look closely, you can see it's the color of the background coming through the black drawing lines. And then they were just, um, you know, diluted to make the tone. So that is, you know, one of those instances where leave well alone if it works. Right. Um, quite a few questions here about um, the tinted background, and, and you're covering this in the book as well, I can see, um, painting on a tinted background. Somebody is asking if you ever use colored watercolor paper for a portrait. I don't, because I love working on white paper, but there's no reason why not. But then you would be working in gouache, or, or you would be working with a white um, paint, probably, possibly for the light, not necessarily, because it could all be darker than. But I'm not a great lover of coloured watercolour paper, but nothing wrong with it. It's just that I love, as you can see from this picture, I love white paper. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really what you want uh, to bring out the highlights. And so here we have uh, not just a portrait. Well, it is a portrait, but it's the full body. Um, Yes. Now, in a succinct format like the Learn Quickly books, I would have loved there to have been many more pages, but they can't because it's a standard format um, for a series. And so I unfortunately can't spend a great deal of time on full length body portraits, which, of course, are another whole wonderful genre and one that, you know, maybe I'll do a book on that another time. So I just have a brief mention of it in the last chapter so that, it, you know, it, so that people are not thinking, oh, well, a portrait is only head and shoulders because a portrait, you know, is often full body and can be equally exciting 
uh, well, you know, it's very exciting. Um, and so this is a sample from uh, you know, of the of the full body ones. And, but there's only a few in the book because there isn't you know much room. Yeah. All right. And so um, uh, coming to the end here, uh, I had a somebody was asking if uh, this there we're going to be making a video to go with the book, and that brings us to. Da, 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 da. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so Hazel, you're going to be teaching uh, portraits, uh, painting portraits in watercolor on, uh, we're doing a live uh, workshop on Saturday, February 26th at one o'clock. And uh, we are still, you're still pulling it together. And so um, we'll be uh, sending out more information to people. So if anybody is interested in this painting portraits, in watercolor workshop, they should send an email to studio 56 boutique at gmail.com. And we will be happy to forward information about that uh, when the time comes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Can't wait. Okay. So, Hazel, can you come back? There she is. All right. And the other exciting thing that we haven't talked about before, we want everyone to know is that Hazel is coming to the United States. She's going to be teaching um, a, an in-person workshop in San Diego, California in August. And we have only four tickets left. So if people are interested in meeting Hazel in person and taking a week-long vacation workshop uh, in San Diego, beautiful San Diego this August, they should uh, look to the website www.studio56boutique.com and uh, it, all the information is on there and four tickets left. That's all we have. So thank you so much, Hazel, today for this lovely interview. And uh, people, I do want to encourage you that this is a wonderful, wonderful book. It's very well made. It's, it's got all the information that we've covered today and a whole lot more about uh, details about how to approach portrait painting uh, in watercolor and in oil. And it's a gorgeous book and you can order it from Amazon. So thank you so much, Hazel, for a lovely interview today. And I wish you good luck with your book. And um, yeah, we're really looking forward to your online workshop about port painting portraits. It's going to be wonderful. Very much looking forward to creating it as well. And uh, I'm thinking along the lines of maybe doing a self-portrait so that everybody can also do self-portraits. I haven't quite decided, but I think that might be the idea because then everybody's got a, a subject if they don't, I'll probably supply a picture of me so that they can follow along with, with what I'm doing with me. But, um, but anyway, so watch this space. <laughs> yeah, watch this space. All right, so thank you everyone for uh, tuning in. Um, also, if you would like more information about what Hazel's doing, uh, with her online workshops, with her travel workshops, or with interviews like this, please subscribe to our newsletter. It's a monthly newsletter. I will not bombard you because I barely have time to get the monthly newsletter out. And you can do that by going to www.studio56boutique.com and a pop-up will appear there where you can um, subscribe to the newsletter. And um, yeah, that's, I think we've covered everything. Thank you so much, Hazel. And thank you everyone for coming. Have a wonderful day. All right. Thanks so much. Bye for now. Bye.